Welcome back to the Last Days Book Club, where we are reading the book entitled Pioneers Together by Josephine Cunnington Edwards. This book is a biography of Roy F. Cottrell and his wife Murty, who were both born in 1878 and led an exciting life of service and mission in the early days of the young and rapidly growing Seventh-day Adventist Church. In our last reading, we covered chapters 1, 2, and part of chapter 3, where we learned first of Roy's early years in middle school, when he had no trouble correcting the teacher concerning the erroneous teachings of Christmas celebrating the birth of Jesus, or Sunday worship celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. He was nicknamed Seven by Nine, Constantine, and Professor by his classmates since he was the only SDA in the school for his explanation to the teacher in the class on the origin of Sunday worship and because of his outspoken ambition to become a teacher. In chapter 2, we learned of Roy's lineage stretching all the way back to the Albigenses in southeastern France, his pride in such an ancestry, and his love for his mother and her siblings, who were not afraid to stand for their faith in the face of persecution and death. His Aunt May was a missionary in India, and his uncle, Charles Taylor, was the author of the well-known book, The Marked Bible, as well as a Bible teacher at Mount Vernon Academy in Ohio, where he was influential in getting Roy acceptance into that now famous institution. In chapter 3, we discovered Roy's determination and ambition to work hard to raise the funds to attend the academy, his early and successful coal portering efforts, and his progress at that school despite the hard farm work he was required to do to meet his room and board expenses. We pick up the story today after Roy, through prayer, has overcome any doubts about his intended service for the Lord and Christian education. Faith, trust in God, and fervent prayer brought him the victory. And as the story continues, he never looked back, but went forward to a life of service, study, and mission. Roy slept soundly, and as morning dawned, he seemed to have entered upon a new era in life. A few days later, he tried to think of the jibes and expressions of contempt that had almost made shipwreck of his life, but he could not even recall them. The evil thoughts of doubt were gone forever, and victory was complete. Things went along well until about two weeks before the close of school. Again, Roy was looking forward with deep pleasure to his return home and reunion with his loved ones. But while he was studying one evening, Dean Clymer knocked at the door and handed him a yellow envelope. A telegram. In those days, a telegram nearly always meant bad news. No one spent much money on swiftness of communication unless it was an emergency. With palpitating heart and trembling fingers, he opened it and read the message. Father, very ill. Come home immediately. Packing was different than he had planned. It was hurried and agonized. He thought of all the kindnesses and goodness of the man who was his father. He was frantic lest he return too late to see him again. He caught the midnight train for Medina, New York. The future looked very dark. Then Roy thought of that wonderful period of communion with God in the classroom and went to the true source of peace and comfort. He was learning that his strength also could be made perfect through suffering. 
instead of having a part in the joyous sound of closing activities at the school. Roy spent the next few weeks in the sick room, garden, and everywhere he was needed. He slept with one ear open, so to speak, so that he could hear the slightest move of the invalid. The farm and garden must also be cultivated, for that was the livelihood of the family. Yet, lying there, suffering pitifully, was his dear father, and Roy's heart ached to help him. And then a wonderful thing occurred. A friend had written to the celebrated Dr. John Harvey Kellogg concerning the acute illness of James U. Cottrell, Roy's father. Right at the time when it seemed the whole family was at the breaking point, a letter arrived from the world-renowned Dr. Kellogg inviting Mr. Cottrell to come to Battle Creek as a guest patient in the great sanitarium, then known throughout the world for its efficient methods of treating the sick. Father was tenderly placed on the train, and a look of hope lit up his face. It meant something to the sufferer to know that someone was going to such great lengths to help him. With this burden lifted, Roy felt that he must, he just must, secure sufficient funds for another year at Mount Vernon Academy. Money did not come flying through the air like the leaves in autumn. It was already midsummer, and only 28 days were left to work before the opening of school. The hurdle was high between him and his goal. But Roy was used to surmounting obstacles to gain a longed-for prize. When he was about three years old, he suffered an unfortunate accident to his throat that paralyzed his vocal cords. Previous to that, he had spoken normally, but after this injury, his speech was sadly impaired. To attempt to talk was embarrassing. When he was about nine years old, an uncle said to him, Roy, if you will overcome this habit of stammering by the time of your twelfth birthday, I will give you my watch. He had heard of how Demosthenes, the Greek orator, overcame the impediment in his speech by holding pebbles in his mouth and talking to the waves by the seashore. So, Roy held pebbles in his mouth and talked to the trees and meadows. At length, when he was fourteen, he had made such improvement that the watch was given to him. Roy was now eighteen years of age. He knew that ahead of him was the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He had no time to waste in time-consuming amusement. The serious business of preparing for a life of service for the king pressed upon him. Though he worked early and late, it was apparent he would still lack funds for a year's expenses at the academy. At last, he wrote to the new principal and asked about prospects for student labor during the coming year. The quick reply brought a thrill to his heart. A portion of it read something like this. My dear young friend, there will be plenty of work for you here at the academy. You may rest assured on that score. We will be looking for you and hope that nothing will prevent your being with us again. Most cordially yours, J.W. Lowhead. Good word arrived often from the sanitarium as to his father's continued spectacular improvement. And before the 28 days were ended, James Cottrell was home again, in the cool shadows of the farmhouse, with mother singing about her work. He looked like a different man, and Roy felt like going out in the woods and shouting for true joy. God's in his heaven. All's right 
with the world. The book delivery was a marked success and September found Roy back in old room four arranging his shirts, cuffs, collars and socks neatly in the familiar bureau drawers and putting his sheets and mother's pieced quilts on the double bed. The crowning joy came a day or so after his arrival. He was assigned to the very job he had lost the previous year. The keys to the pantries, storerooms, lockers and kitchen were given to him again. The pay was good and the responsibility was such that he took great pride in doing his very best. And for the next two years, he proved to everyone's satisfaction that he was worthy of this trust. It was a favored position of honor and helped him greatly in meeting his expenses. Though he was always conscious of his difficulty in speech, Roy improved in a marked manner. Then another sheaf was added to his bundle of victories. Near the close of the year, a junior class program was arranged for public demonstration with different students representing different subjects. Roy's responsibility was to represent the geometry class, armed with blackboard, chalk, yardstick, and string. He demonstrated three problems so ably that the next morning he was invited to the office of Principal Lowhead. Roy, the good man said, you came to us here at Mount Vernon as a stammering boy, able to do little in a public way. Last night, I confess, you gave me a great surprise. I had not realized how you had grown and improved. You arose before that large audience and clearly demonstrated those difficult propositions. You knew exactly what you were going to say. You spoke clearly and eagerly and without the least hesitation. I was most amazed and gratified. And do you know, Roy, what went through my mind as you stood there, confidently and logically proving your theorems point by point? It was this. Any Christian boy who can give such clear-cut explanations as that would also be able to stand before large congregations and logically present such prophecies as the 1260 years and the 2300 days. I believe you are called to the gospel ministry. This conversation with the principal was the crowning event of a happy year. Roy had hardly dared to believe such a thing possible. He had struggled long with his thorn in the flesh. Now, God willing, his name might be added to the family heritage, to those of the rugged, fearless Albigensian forebears, to John, to Nicholas, and to Roswell. Now he too might take up the torch of truth to illumine the path of others. The end of chapter 3. Chapter 4. The Boy Preacher and Teacher. During the year 1897, while Grover Cleveland was president, very hard times plagued the nation. Soup kitchens were set up in the big cities. Factories stood silent. No smoke coming from the great stacks, none of the machinery moving. Relief work for the poor and unemployed was hardly organized in this country. Thousands were out of work, and men walked the streets hunting for just anything to do in order to feed their hungry families. During this difficult period, Roy tried to sell religious books in an almost hopeless effort to earn money for school expenses. The Lord had always helped him before, and he had never been a person to sit down to await opening providences. 
He remembered that the best way to cause fruit to fall into your lap is to shake the tree and to shake it vigorously. People gave book orders reluctantly, worriedly. Roy saw their eyes light up at the sight of the book, only to see the light die and faces settle back into lines of discouragement. I'm sorry, sir, but I cannot take that book I ordered. We all wanted it. The children looked forward to having it. But my husband is out of work and has been for a long time. We have to worry about money for coal for the winter and food for us and the children. And we just haven't got it. Roy's heart ached for the many cases of actual want he came in contact with. Also, his own worries were looming large. God had always opened the way in some manner, yet work as hard as he could. He simply could not make enough that summer to return to Mount Vernon for his senior year. But God did not fail him. Generous Aunt Nancy came forward with a substantial gift and on arrival at Mount Vernon, he got his old job back as student steward. At times during the year, he did some literature evangelist work in the country around the school. Then as interest was awakened, he began to conduct Bible studies in the homes of the people. Roy was beginning his important life work. A short time before he graduated from Mount Vernon Academy, one of the teachers, Professor F. W. Field, came to the young man with a proposition. Roy, he said, I have been invited by the Ohio Conference to conduct a series of evangelistic meetings this summer at Beaver Pond down near the Ohio River. They have suggested that I select a student to accompany me. How would you like to work with me this summer? Roy's face lit up with pleasure. Life was thrilling, exciting. I would be very happy, he replied simply. This is the sort of work I had planned to do. Accordingly, Professor Field, who later became director of the Japan Mission, made all the arrangements. Not many days later, the two of them boarded the train with trunks and equipment bound for Adams County, Ohio, then a very backward county. The one Seventh-day Adventist family in the county had agreed to room and board the preachers. At that time, a large portion of the county was covered with the indigenous forests of the drift area, as that part of Ohio was called. This part was somewhat swampy, and throughout were oaks, maples, hickories, walnuts, and elms growing profusely. To Roy, accustomed as he was to the well-developed, well-drained lands of his birth south of Lake Ontario, Adams County at that time was primitive indeed. The roads were narrow and poor, often leading through the midst of the forest. Occasionally, a clearing would show farms and gardens and a few acres. The many stumps still about showed how the former staunch residents of the Ohio River Valley resisted the agrarian invasion of man. Many of the homes were semi-isolated and the people were news hungry. Visitors were made welcome everywhere. Professor Field and Roy were greatly encouraged by the warm reception accorded. But to eat in some of the homes almost turned Roy's stomach. Neither doors nor windows were screened. Nearby barns, heaps of fertilizer, and primitive sanitary conditions bred swarms of flies. Even though aprons were pinned over the windows just before the mealtime, hundreds of flies remained inside the houses. Women and girls had branches from trees 
or sticks to which newspaper streamers had been fastened. During mealtime, they patiently tried to keep the pests away from the table and out of the food. Yet, it was quite impossible. Not only that, swarms of mosquitoes and gnats arose from the swampy land to further make life a burden. The meetings were well attended. Farmers drove in, their farm wagons full of eager people. Roy and his teacher associate were busy all the time, visiting, giving studies, keeping the meeting hall in order, attending to their personal needs, and studying for the sermons. As a beginner, Roy spoke twice a week. He studied and worked long hours to make his discourses interesting, timely, and spirit-filled. He had never been so busy, nor had he ever had so many mosquito bites. One day, as he was preparing for the evening service, he began to feel very ill. His head ached terribly, and it seemed as if his eyes would burst. Even ordinary daylight was painful. Professor Field graciously took his place, hoping and expecting that Roy would be better by morning. He seemed somewhat improved the next day, and tried to go about his work as usual. But by nightfall, the headache had returned in full force, and he could neither sleep nor eat. He wondered if he had stayed out too long in the sun on the days he was visiting. He wondered many things. To the relief of all, on the morning of the third day, he felt so much better that with Bible and notebook, he began preparing for the evening service. But after dinner, he became so ill that the whole household was alarmed. Professor Fields sent for the nearest doctor, whose office was some twenty miles away. At length he arrived and entered the sick room, where Roy lay in a feverish agony of pain. His verdict? Typhoid fever. There were words to strike terror to the heart, for in those days the disease was frequently fatal. More than likely, the old country doctor who came had never seen a medical college nor taken a course in the art of healing. Many of the physicians in those days worked with another practitioner until they felt wise enough to hang out their own shingles. Among the prime remedies of that era were nux vomica, laudanum, mercury, and calomel. One prescription in an old medical book reads, leptandrin, 30 grams, podophyllin, 10 grams, pulverized cayenne pepper, 10 grams, EXT nux vomica, 6 grams, quinine, 12 grams, mix, mix 24 pills, give three times a day. No wonder many typhoid patients did not survive the rigors of the treatment. Roy was given some of these poisonous drugs. He grew so much worse that when his mother came, summoned from New York State, she was extremely upset. Roy did not even recognize her. Dark days followed, when it seemed many times as if the flickering flame of the young life must go out. About this time, when all hope of recovery seemed gone, a remarkable chain of events occurred. No one could doubt afterward that God was directing. At about 10 o'clock one night, Mrs. Field, who was in Mount Vernon, received a letter from her husband in which he told of Roy's desperate condition. She was so upset that she went immediately to the home of Principal Lauhead, a half mile away, to read him the letter. The principal later related to Roy the following. When I received that distressing news, I could hardly sleep. 
At five o'clock in the morning, I arose and went to the barn, hitched up old Gip, and drove to the home of Dr. Furkiat in Mount Vernon. I awakened him and told him that down near the Ohio River, one of my boys was in a critical condition and that I wanted him to go down and take care of him. He said that it was impossible for him to leave, for he had only recently opened his physiotherapy unit in Mount Vernon. He had some very sick patients. Besides that, he had no money. But I told him I would not take no for an answer. I would provide the funds, and his helpers must take care of his patients. He just must go. Reluctantly, and with many protests, he packed his bags. We rushed him to the station, purchased his ticket, and I called to him as he pulled out. Now you must stay by that boy as long as he needs you. I will take care of the necessary expenses. Then I returned to the academy, and the brothers and sisters there implored the Heavenly Father to spare Roy's life. Meanwhile, in a darkened room of the old farmhouse, Roy tossed and turned, muttering with fever. His lips were cracked, his eyes glassy. There was no cool ice to lay in packs on his fevered brow, or soothing treatments to give him rest. But help was coming, on the train wending its way around hills, over bridges, and through the rich cornlands of Ohio. Twenty-four hours later, Dr. Furkiart walked into that isolated home in the hills of southern Ohio. What a relief it was to the agonized mother, keeping a sleepless vigil over her unconscious son. The doctor washed his hands carefully and went into the bedroom to examine Roy. He asked the farmer, Mr. Spawn, if he would go to the station two miles away and get his baggage. The farmer lingered a minute. How is he, doctor? He asked anxiously. Dr. Furkiat shook his head. He may not be alive when you get back with my bags, he replied grimly. The doctor then observed that Roy was having a severe hemorrhage. He bound cords about his legs to relieve the blood pressure in his abdomen. It was plain to see that the doctor had arrived just in time to save Roy's life. Since no ice was obtainable, cloths dipped in cold well water were used to cool the fevered head and body. Mrs. Cottrell helped the doctor all she could so that when he should be forced to lie down and rest, she could go on with the treatments. But Dr. Fursia would not lie down during those first anguished hours, for it seemed that the weight of a hear would turn the tide. At length, the watchers were rewarded with a slight, almost undiscernible turn for the better. The whole household seemed to revolve around the sick room, busy with ministrations of Battle Creek methods, not poisonous drugs, but treatments that helped nature wage the valiant war for recovery. Coming back to sensibility was a slow, vague, and wavering process. The first indication that Roy was becoming conscious was when he heard someone go to the pump. He listened to the vigorous actions of the handle, the flow of the water, and then dimly he saw someone enter the darkened room. The doctor's form came into view. Dr. Fursiat, how did he get here from Mount Vernon, Roy wondered. Then he winced. An ice-cold compress went plop right on his sore, sunk-in stomach. Of all the nerve, and Dr. Fursiat at that, taking advantage of a fellow when he was down and couldn't help himself? Doctor, he burst out with resentment. Didn't I hear you go to the well and pump that cold water just now? And you came right in here and threw it on me. And I'm sick. I'm surprised at you. I don't want a doctor like that. You're discharged. 
These first words Roy had spoken for many days greatly amused everyone in the house. The doctor chuckled, and even Roy's mother smiled wanly. She could not be amused, for her boy, once so sturdy and healthy, was now like a living skeleton. Thin skin stretched over bones, but hope stirred in her heart. Now Roy might get well. He would live. For the first time in many weeks, she felt the terrible load of agony lift somewhat from her heart. The doctor took Roy's temperature. To everyone's joy, his fever was gone, and so were the agonizing, searing headaches. Those terrible, tossing nights at the outset of his illness seemed long, long ago. He was able to eat lightly now, to sit up. He began to sleep all night, giving his mother and the kind doctor the first real rest they had enjoyed for weeks. Then Dr. Fursiat felt free to go back to his clinic and his practice. And Roy was not the only one who shed tears of appreciation when the good man climbed into Mr. Spahn's buggy to be taken to the train. Sometime later, Roy received the following amazing bill from Dr. Fursiat. For medical services rendered, $35. It was unbelievable. For all the days and nights of tireless labor, for working on, for trying everything when it seemed useless to do anything. Yet, Roy knows today that he owes his life to Dr. Fursiat. Nourishing food, sleep, and good care helped Roy mend rapidly. As soon as it was safe, he and his mother took the train for the 48-hour journey to New York State and home. Pillows and quilts were taken to make the long, tiring journey as easy as possible. Before he became sick, Roy tipped the scales at 142 pounds. Now, pale, weak, but climbing slowly back to health, he was a mere shadow of his former self, weighing only 93 pounds. Friends in Adams County had outdone themselves, preparing a good lunch for the travelers, with a special thought as to what Roy could eat homemade bread, cottage cheese, other delicious items, and a bottle of milk served Roy and his mother well. At length, they were under the shelter of their own roof. How good Roy's room looked. How delightful the water from the old well tasted. And as for cooking, no one, no matter how hard she tried, could make things taste as good as mother could. Every day found Roy a little stronger, a little better able to walk. Soon he could dress without resting. In four months, he felt as good as new. It was then that Roy received his first call to a church pastorate. Elder G. B. Thompson, president of the New York Conference, called him to serve the church at Rochester, New York, which had a membership of about 100. Roy's salary was to be the magnificent sum of $5 a week. Even in that day, this amount was hardly adequate for board, room, and clothing. He was therefore told he could supplement the slender stipend by doing literature evangelist work in the city, coupling this, as he did at Mount Vernon, with Bible studies and pastoral work. Roy plunged into his task, happy for his first church and beloved by its members. He accomplished much. He had no car, of course, no one had. Day after day, he traveled by streetcar or bicycle or tramped the streets 
with prospectus and Bible. During this time, he passed his 21st birthday. In those days, young ministers' summers were usually devoted to tent evangelism. Roy was asked to go to the town of Herkimer with another young man, a graduate of Battle Creek College. The big tent was pitched, and the meetings began auspiciously with good attendance. Roy and the other young man organized their subjects, took turns preaching, and soon had a long visiting list. Just when the interest seemed at its peak, Satan took an interest in their work. A woman who lived in an adjoining house became violently and noisily insane using outrageous language. It seemed incongruous, for she had been a prominent church worker. Today, she would be removed for disturbing the peace, for she screamed and shouted so terribly every night that the young evangelists were forced to move to another location. In spite of this serious disruption, some hearts were touched, and a small church was organized in Herkimer. During this busy summer, Roy received an invitation from Dayton, Ohio, to teach a church school. The young man was torn between two real desires. He would have loved to continue in ministerial work in his home state of New York. But he had heard many, even veterans in church work, state positively the value of teaching experience for young people entering into any type of service. Roy accordingly rearranged his plans and started in ample time to be on hand for the opening of school. After the long trip of 500 miles, he went to the home of the board chairman with whom he had communicated. He was met by a man with a long gloomy face who told him curtly that the school board had just taken action deciding that it would be too expensive to conduct a school that year. They would pay his fare back to New York. This was too much for Roy to comprehend. Business should not be run this way. They should never have called him, inconveniencing him and wasting his time if they had not known their mind in the matter. He knew that Ellen G. White had written, in all our churches there should be schools and teachers in these schools who are missionaries. Where does your pastor live? Roy asked. Uh, why, uh, he agrees with us. It will be too expensive to run a school this year. But where does he live? Continued Roy. I'd like to speak to him. It was Friday, and Roy had barely time to meet the pastor and prepare for the Sabbath. He asked the kindly man for the privilege of preaching in the Dayton church the following morning, the only time in all his life that he had ever made such a request. This being surprisingly and willingly granted, on that Friday evening, Roy spent his time preparing a message on Christian education. After his years at Mount Vernon Academy, he was completely sold on the subject. Sabbath morning dawned, and from the platform, Roy's heart went out in pity to the many children and young people before him who would not, unless the Lord intervened, attend church school that year. The Holy Spirit must have been present. Fresh from a wonderful school, Roy still savored its sweetness. And with eloquence and boyish enthusiasm, he told of the defects and dangers of secular education. He dwelt on the worldly connections and associations which would be forced upon the young people if they spent a great deal of time in that kind of company. In closing, he made the appeal, reading from the spirit of prophecy, the solemn admonition to gather the children into cities of refuge. The audience was deeply stirred, and at the conclusion, Roy asked, Now, how many of you believe in the principles of Christian education? Every hand in the church was raised. He quickly followed this question with another. 
How many of you are willing to sacrifice in order to have a church school this year? Roy was gratified to see many hands raised again, and he pursued the point. How many are in favor of conducting a church school here in Dayton this year? The affirmative vote was practically unanimous. A good feeling prevailed, and the pastor did not appear to be displeased, nor did he censure Roy for usurping his authority. He appeared inwardly happy with the turn of events. Many volunteered to come on Sunday to help set the schoolroom in readiness, and it was announced that school would open at 9 o'clock Monday morning. Thus it was that Roy, with the Lord guiding his youthful enthusiasm, turned a seeming defeat into victory. Thirty-three pupils enrolled in grades one to nine, and the young preacher-teacher found himself involved in a major, more than full-time task. Such a buzzing hive of activity. Roy had to see that all his students were busy. He heard classes, helped the little ones read, guided small hands in writing their first sprawling letters, gave counsel, and worked out problems that were not solved by any book on pedagogy. Schoolwork continued happily and smoothly, and throughout the entire year, there was but one major case of discipline. One day, as school was being dismissed, a boy in his teens, nearly as big as his teacher, was asked to remain after school. When the last child had lingeringly departed, Roy closed and locked the door. Robert flushed with anger and clenched his fist. Mr. Cottrell, he burst out, what are you going to do? I tell you, you'll never lick me. Roy had endeavored to help this young man overcome his quick temper, but this was time for action. He said determinedly, I haven't told you what I'm going to do, but we are certainly going to get some things settled. Robert then grabbed a big jackknife from his pocket, opened it, and brandished a wicked-looking blade. Now, come after me if you dare, he snarled. Robert, Roy said sternly, you put that knife up immediately, or we'll have a policeman here to take care of you before you know what's happened. Robert realized he had gone too far and laid the knife aside. But still furious, he seized his heavy ruler and holding it high above his head, gestured menacingly. Now I'm ready for you, he threatened. Roy did not hesitate. He advanced quickly, jerked the boy from his desk and landed him on the floor. He wrenched the ruler from the boy's hand and Robert got just what he richly deserved, a thorough, vigorous paddling. So earnestly did Roy apply the ruler, that soon Robert called out in a far different tone, Oh, teacher, you'll kill me, you'll kill me. No, Roy replied, still applying the ruler lustily, but you'll remember this day for a long time. Remember, you asked for it in more ways than one. Robert agreed almost feverishly, and the punishment started so suddenly and unexpectedly was over. The two sat for a moment, quiet and thoughtful. Both breathed a bit heavily. At length, Roy spoke, regret in his voice. Robert, he said gently, when I began teaching, I determined never to punish a pupil without first praying with him. Today, when I asked you to remain in your seat, I had it in mind to talk and to pray with you. I wanted to find out your attitude and to see if you would be obedient and cooperative. I certainly had not made any decision to whip you. You forced me into it against my will and opposite to my plan. Now let us talk with Jesus, Robert, for your life is very precious in his sight. 
It grieves God, even more than me, to see you starting out wrong. Robert's face was a study. All the hateful lines of rebellion were gone. The humility and respect that rested on his young features were rewarding to behold. It was a moment of victory. He prayed a stumbling, penitent prayer, watered with his tears. When they arose, Roy sensed the bond of affection between them that he had never felt before. He asked if Robert would like to have him go with him to his home and talk this over with his father and mother. He did not like to punish any pupil without apprising the parents, lest his actions be resented and misunderstood. Then he noted a strange look. Half of pride, half of shame, crossed the boy's countenance. Roy had not been so long out of adolescence that he could misunderstand this. Or, Robert, would you rather we keep it a secret, just between you and me? The boy's face cleared. The look of admiration deepened. Oh, Mr. Cottrell, let's not say anything about it to anyone. And the secret between them was a bond that cemented their friendship. A little later, the Bible instructor was on her way to church when Robert, with his long strides, overtook her. Well, Robert, she said pleasantly, how goes the school? Just fine, he answered her, a smile spreading all over his face. And I tell you, I never appreciated Mr. Cottrell more than I have the last few weeks. It was interesting to follow the products of that school year in Dayton. A number of the boys and girls developed into workers in the church, even to the second and third generations. Only in heaven can the calculations of souls won and victories achieved be accurately summed up. What things, glorious and beautiful, might not have happened had this project been deemed impractical. The church school idea was then awakening in Seventh-day Adventist churches throughout the country. Visions bright and beautiful of the great scope to which our educational work must attain continued to come from the pen of his messenger, Ellen G. White. Get out of the large cities, she wrote through inspiration. Establish church schools. Give your children the word of God as the foundation of all their education. This is full of beautiful lessons. And if pupils make it their study in the primary grade below, they will be prepared for the higher grade above. Testimonies, Volume 6, page 195. As people began to see the light, the work grew fast. The first teachers' convention and institute was announced to convene in early summer in Battle Creek. Ever since Roy was old enough to understand anything, the name Battle Creek held a peculiar charm for him. Here was located the Battle Creek College, a mecca for every aspiring young Seventh-day Adventist who longed for a Christian education. Here also was the great sanitarium, outstanding because of the marvelous cures achieved there through drugless therapy. The world was beginning to sit up and take notice. Yet it was understandable only to those who knew full well that Mrs. White had been in personal touch with the great physician. Again and again, words of inspiration came from her lips, strange words to many physicians then. When attacked by disease, she wrote, many will not take the trouble to search out the cause of their illness. Their chief anxiety is to rid themselves of pain and inconvenience. People need to be taught that drugs do not cure disease. It is true that they sometimes afford present relief and the patient appears to recover as a result of their use. But in most cases, the drug only changes the form and location of the disease. The results remain in the system and work great harm at some later period. The Ministry of Healing, page 126. 
Another drawing card for Battle Creek was the publishing house from which were issued the denominational books seen in the bookcases of Seventh-day Adventists all over America. With great anticipation, Roy planned to attend the coming convention to be held at the world headquarters of Seventh-day Adventists. As soon as school was out, it was Battle Creek for him. The end of chapter four of Pioneers Together. <laughs>